silent mode. Our staff are at your disposal for any assistance you might need. If you need support, please report to the information desk. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We will start now session six on risk and impact assessment. Uh, so I'm going to, to call uh, our first speaker, Peter Beck. He will present his, pre uh, uh, his presentation entitled Monitoring the Impact of Silela on Apulia's Olive Orcas Using Sentinel-2 Satellite Data and Aerial Photographs. Peter. Uh, Good morning, everybody. So this was the title of the talk I submitted. This is the talk I will give. Um, I will not talk about Sentinel-2 data, MODIS satellite data, another satellite. Doesn't make much difference. I'll justify why. And rather than focus on the uh, aerial photography, I'll talk. I'll mention how we use weather data in conjunction with the satellite data, and I'll mention what we did with the aerial photos. So this is an image you saw yesterday as well. It's the official monitoring data in Puglia of uh, plants that tested positive for xylella. Um, and I, I commend the, the region for making these data available as points rather than just at administrative level because it's really useful to science. Um, the law uh, requires that these data really focus on establishing the front of the epidemic, uh, which is why areas further south are not being monitored anymore. That means that we don't really have a good view on the damage that xylella has done in those areas that have in, been infected for longer. We know the damage is there. Um, you can see it even if you go there. Uh, you can see it in uh, Google Earth. Um, but we don't really know very precisely how big it extends, which is important if you want to assess the impact of xylella at larger scales. So the question we're trying to answer is, can we monitor severe damage to olive orchards across Apulia? Uh, what do we mean with severe damage? Let's establish that. Here is a series of photos illustrating a damage scale from zero in the top left, which is an entirely healthy looking tree, to number four, which is an, uh, a tree without any live branches or many live branches left. And then steps one, two, and three uh, which are the transition from zero to four. When we talk about severe damage, as we define it here, we focus on levels three and four, really. So, so very conspicuous damage at the level of trees. And that is what we try to monitor with satellite data. Just to be clear, we're not talking about early detection. Early detection we work on as well with sensors on aircraft. That's where you're trying to get those first symptoms on a tree. Uh, as it moves out of looking healthy and, uh, after infection. So let's, let's make that clear. We're not trying to do early detection here. We're doing damage mapping. Olive orchards come in many different shapes and sizes, which is a challenge to remote sensing. They can look very uh, regular with uh, similar sized crowns. Uh, they can look very irregular with very different shapes and backgrounds. And that is important because when you look at satellite data, uh, from above, what you see mostly is the ground rather than the trees, as these aerial photographs illustrate. And then at a relatively small scale, you can have big variations in how green the, uh, that understory is. Has it been plowed? Here at the bottom, you see very small trees, which actually still might be healthy. They just might be recently planted. Drier, wetter, greener, less green areas. And that makes it challenging in, when you look at images to say, is this an a healthy orchard or a non-healthy orchard, because most of the variation you're looking at is actually not the trees. So we chose a satellite time series that allows us to go also back in time, back to 2000, um, so that we can look at orchards through time to overcome some of these issues. The downside of those data is that the pixels are very big. So this is one pixel uh, as the MODIS satellite data sees it. So we're integrating sorry, information across this entire area. On the upside, we have it back to the year 2000, and we have data every single year. So we thought about it a bit differently, and we thought really of that temporal aspect of what happens to an orchard when it goes from healthy to being uh, severely damaged. And basically, uh, what we hypothesized is that you go from a system that is dominated by an evergreen canopy, which the olive trees provide, to one which is dominated by 
much more shrubby vegetation and, a, and a, no longer a canopy. And that system differs profoundly because these trees, of course, access deep, older water with their deeper roots, whereas this shrubby vegetation uh, is much more sensitive to short-term changes in uh, water availability. So we further then predicted that as a system uh, gets, or an orchard gets severely damaged, you move away from, um, or, or you see a shift in the way the vegetation and its productivity responds to heat, to drought, to water availability, and that we model from weather data. So basically we made a model that says, depending on the weather, how green productive should the orchard look in the satellite data in a given year, and then we compare that prediction later on to what the satellite ac actually sees, and the difference, we hoped, would indicate the level of damage to the orchard. We work at the level of orchards, not at the level of trees, that's important to note. Uh, in the infected and buffer zone together, there are about 27,000 orchards. They cover over 2,000 square kilometers. And we furthermore focused on the large orchards. And we defined those as being bigger than 12 and a half hectares. And we chose that because that gives us at least two modus pixels to look at for every single orchard. If you restrict it to those large orchards, you still cover 80% of the area, of the olive orchard area. So just keep in mind that we make conclusions on the large orchards. You probably need to add another 20% to make it comprehensive. So this is what the large orchards here in dark gray look like for uh, the infected area plus buffer zone. There's uh, just over 3,100 of them. And then we let that method loose. So we took that model that was trained on data from 2000 to 2010 with the observations from satellite of the presumably healthy olive orchards. We then tried to uh, have the model predict based on the weather data how productive slash green that signal should be. Then we took that same model, kept it running in the years after 2010 and compared it with what the satellite saw. If that difference is big, we hoped we would see areas that were severely damaged. So the first detections uh, we made among those 3,000 orchards, we let the model go, uh, are shown here. These areas here were detected as damaged uh, 2012, particularly 2013. And this is the area right in front of Gallipoli. So this is a first good sign that our model is actually picking up xylella-related damage, but this is, because this is, of course, where the infection was first reported around 2013. So, uh, yay for that. Um, but that's, of course, not sufficient to validate our, our method. I'll show, of course, the, the pre predictions for subsequent years later on. I'll just keep you waiting for those a bit. So how do we validate this model? Um, we have two sources of independent validation data. One is the official monitoring data, which includes not only the points where the infections have been found, but also the demarcated area. And that's useful because we can assume that the buffer zone is xylella-free and hence damage-free. So we'll use that. And then the second source of the uh, information are the field observations made in nine plots where every single tree has been scored between zero and four in two subsequent years. And we can assess what's the level of damage as seen on the ground for these orchards. And that we can compare to our predictions. So first to the official monitoring data. Um, this is the, the result for orchards in the buffer zone. So we assume those have no widespread damage. You see it through time, and this is basically that residual of our, our model prediction based on the weather compared to what we observed in the satellite. And we expect that to be around zero, because these orchards should be intact olive orchards. We see that signal from 2001 to 2017, indeed sit around the zero line. If it were higher, the orchard would be more productive than we expect. We actually have a bit of a trend uh, of that in the last years, but uh, I'll leave that aside. If it were lower, then it means the olive orchard is not behaving like an olive orchard anymore because it's less productive than we'd expect. But we, for the orchards in the buffer zone, the behavior is as we'd, uh, as we'd hoped. Now I put on top of that, individual orchards that we know were infected, but we showed them before they were infected. And they too, here every line is a different orchard, they sit around that zero line just as the orchards in the buffer zone do. And now I'll add them how they behaved 
after the date where the official data indicates they were infected. They look like this. So you see that that signal drops off very strongly, which indicates indeed that what a satellite sees in terms of greenness slash productivity is less than what we'd expect based on the weather if these olive orchards were intact. And this is really the signal that we're exploiting to map because we're basically then saying, when does a line for an olive orchard drop be below the expected value and stay below the expected value? And that we can map every year to estimate when damage occurred in a particular orchard and if damage occurred. So that's the first validation. Second validation, if you focus here on the y-axis, this is the field observations going from healthy trees to sick trees at damage level three. So this is averaged at the level of plots. Every dot is a plot. That is the average level of damage of the trees in that plot. And on the x-axis here, you have those residuals just like you had on the y-axis in the previous plot, where here are the orchards. We don't see the behavior being too different from what we expect. And here, that the behavior is very different. And you see that correlates very well, well, pretty well. Uh, our squares of about 0 0.6, with basically, as the damage is greater, we see those anomalies uh, increase. Uh, I won't explain here exactly the scale, but uh, that's why you see the negative correlation. Then we have a couple of dots here that are clearly off. Uh, we're not too worried about those, because if you look at the size of those plots, it's only a few hectares. These plots, they're actually less than a fifth of one single pixel in the satellite. So we're looking for a very small signal in a pretty big pixel. Uh, so that 12.5 hectare rule here doesn't apply. All these plots are a lot smaller than the, the minimum observation unit of the satellite data. Actually, uh, I'm not presenting these data well because these are nine plots measured over two different years. So here we color them by year. And we see also that the condition was worse in 2017 than in 2016. And also that our method picks up pretty well. And actually, if we then connect the, pair, the same plot when it was measured in two years, you see that even at the plot level, we're picking up the progression and the worsening of symptoms with our method. Those two plots that we got wrong initially, one actually got corrected in a way, so our mapping wouldn't pick that up because it would say, look, here it's very anomalous, but the next year it's okay again, so we're not going to map that as damaged, whereas this one is wrong. But this won't show up in our maps because it falls well below the 12.5 hectare threshold. The other thing that is interesting to note is I said initially we'll focus on damage levels three and four, but actually we're picking up the damage also, we're, we would be able to pick up the damage at lower uh, severity levels as well, it seems. If I now put on top of that where the olive orchards in the buffer zone sit, so, so those we assume have no damage, they sit really in the, in the lower left corner here of our, of our plot, which is also uh, a good sign because that means we, we wouldn't be mapping any damage in those. So now let me get to results. This is that initial map with the damage we saw in 2012, 2013. By the end of 14, uh, 15, sorry, this is the damage we detected. You see you have a couple of, of dots here. This might be damaged for other reasons. They might have been cleared, those orchards. Uh, it's not necessarily Xylella, let me stress that. We're not doing attribution to the cause of the damage here, but the pattern we see through time is consistent with what we'd expect from Xylella. We see the ground zero near Gallipoli, and we see the spread uh, in concentric circles, as it were, following the pattern that we know exists from the official monitoring data. Yeah? But it gives a more wall-to-wall -wall picture. The other thing to note in this comparison is that the colors here are darker than here. They're on the same color scale. What that means, darker colors, means that we have the positive infections detected a few years before we see the damage, which is also what we'd expect, of course. Damage, if it's xylella cost, should lag the infection. So that's another corroboration of our results. How big is the detected damaged area? So if we count up all those olive orchards that we detected as damaged, the, which are only the large ones, we come to 438 square kilometers by the end of 2017. Add to that 20%, which is roughly what sits in smaller orchards, you come to 650 square kilometers damaged areas. Uh, we are using aerial photographs to estimate uh, how many trees there are in each of these orchards. But actually, and luckily, 
you get pretty good approximation if you say there are 100 olive trees per hectare. Yeah? So multiplying this number with 10,000, which is then the uh, number of square meters, sorry, number of trees, you'd get per unit area, you come to six and a half million trees in those heavily damaged orchards. And that area, as you see here, oh, sorry, uh, is growing steadily. And uh, there's no sign of it slowing down. So with a minute left to wrap things up, we can map severe damage in large olive orchards uh, using satellite data supported by weather data. Our results are confirmed by field observations from the regional monitoring uh, and the plant pathologist, which is completely independent and not used in the training or development of the method. Uh, the pattern we see is consistent with the official surveillance data. We have the ground zero near Gallipoli, damage trails infection, and the spatial pattern is consistent. By 2017, we estimate that in large olive orchards, 438 square kilometers had been damaged. And we foresee to update the analysis with the, when the weather data for 2019 becomes available uh, in the course of November. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We have time for a few questions. Tony? So, P Peter, thanks for the talk, very nice. Uh, my question is about the weather model uh, you use for uh, estimating the productivity, or potential productivity of the olives. It is based on rainfall or temperature or this kind of so, we use two things in that model. It's relatively simple. It's a regression model, um, <clears throat> but it uses an index which basically balances the amount of rainfall coming in and the amount of water that would be evaporated or transpired, right? So it's SPEI in a, in a technical term, which is a standardized precipitation evaporation index. And we add to that also, again, in a way, uh, temperature to, uh, to account really for, for heat stress explicitly. So those are the two meteorological variables going in. Uh, we have those mapped from the reanalysis product era five, uh, which allows them, which allows us to account for spatial as well as temporal variability. And then the model accounts for a random effect at the level of orchards. So we can, we can uh, tune it some, to some degree at the level of individual orchards. Another question? Um, this is a really elegant model, and, uh, and it is very impressive. I was wondering about its planned use. Uh, I mean, uh, I suppose I take it that ground surveys will not be abandoned. So what, what is the complementary be complementarity between your, your, your modeling and its predictions and the ground surveys? Okay. So, for the record, I will never... Uh, argue for abandoning ground uh, surveys. Uh, they, they serve very different purposes. The ground surveys are there to really inform uh, the, the front wave of the epidemic and help us delineate meaningfully the demarcated areas. This is really looking behind the front lines to the trailing edge of the epidemic uh, to get at an estimate of damage. Damage in area, uh, in number of trees, and ultimately in, by other teams, perhaps in economic terms. Uh, so in that sense, they're, they're highly complementary, uh, and this will not inform the, the surveillance. You might have a few cases where we pick up a few areas that appear to be damaged, which maybe are worth to have a look at just to confirm it's not xylella, but, but there's no, um, no substitution aim there at all. It's really to look at a damage impact, and I think more in line with... Uh, uh, the impact assessment work done in the, and presented in the rest of this session. One last question. I have one, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure that you already have data from last year. Yeah. Oh, what is the prediction? How, how much uh, has increased since, since then? 
So, so 2018, we've left aside for a moment. And the reason is that as, as elegant and simple as the model is, it also is not entirely robust. 2018 was very wet in southern Puglia. And basically, what happens, we don't have a year like that in the year that we trained our model on, which is 2000 to 2010. And basically, our model struggles to differentiate between more and less affected areas because everything was green at the beginning of summer, because you had these very heavy rains in June. And that is a limitation that is very clear in this modeling. When you get these anomalous years, you, you might struggle. On the upside, and we had similar situation in 2014, which was a bit odd weather-wise, if we don't pick up the damage one year, we'll catch it the next year probably. So that's why we now will uh, analyze 2018 and 19 together. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephen Parnell. Uh, he will talk about the an update assessment of the risks to plant health posed by Silela fastidiosa in the European Union territory. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm going to give a, uh, an overview of the updated pest risk assessment on Xylella fastidiosa in the EU that was uh, published by EFSA earlier this year. So EFSA published a risk assessment on Xylella in 2015, uh, but we were asked to update that risk assessment um, because a lot has obviously changed with Xylella since 2015 in terms of um, new outbreaks or a development in uh, the situation on the ground, but also developments um, in research. So um, we were asked to update different aspects of the uh, pest risk assessment that was published in 2015 as a result of, of this. So I'm presenting um, a huge amount of work from a large number of people uh, many of which are in the audience and looking at me right now, so I need to do a good job, I think. Um, it was coordinated by Andrea Mirani in, at EFSA, and a large number of people involved, um, both from the Plant Health Panel at EFSA, um, and also external researchers, um, with a big representation from the large uh, EU Horizon 2020 projects, so Ponty and X Factors, and other re research projects such as uh, Bridget from the, the UK. So um, we were asked to update the pest risk assessment um, from a, a range of different perspectives. The thing that we didn't look at was entry. So we looked at every other aspect of uh, that we would consider in a pest risk assessment. So establishment, spread, impact, um, and risk reduction options. And I'm gonna present those um, each in, in turn uh, just now, but they're also being presented at a, in a bit more detail in different aspects um, today and, and yesterday, both in talks and in, in presentations. So the only thing we didn't look at was entry, um, and we were additionally asked to look at this question of the asymptomatic period of xylella. So how long from first infection to the uh, expression of uh, symptoms. We used where we could a quantitative um, approach, but where in some cases the data or the information wasn't available, um, we used a, a qualitative approach to the, the risk assessment. And we tried where, wherever possible where the information was available, we tried to go to subspecies level, um, but in some cases because of information availability that, that wasn't possible. So I'm going to start by explaining uh, the work done on the asymptomatic period. Um, so this is uh, work that was uh, led by um, uh, Marie Agnes Jack and Alex Mastin, and there's a poster in the, the hall with more information on this. But we started with the host plant, EFSA host plant database, and we filtered the, the number of studies in that database depending on those that included um, artificial inoculation, so where we knew where the infection, the time, the, the time of first infection, 
Also, uh, we filtered then by studies that had included um, or, or measured um, when symptoms were first expressed and where there were reliable counts. And all in all this, uh, we reduced down to about 36 papers, which included around uh, 75 experiments on different um, hosts and different subspecies uh, combinations, as you can see here. So the number of uh, experiments available for this assessment differed depending on those, those different combinations. Now, the, um, the, the way these experiments are, are um, typically run is we don't know exactly the time of first expression of symptoms because there are observation intervals. So what we do know is the interval at which um, symptoms were first expressed. So that's called uh, left-censored data. And as well, in some cases, um, experiments had finished before all of the plants had expressed symptoms. So that means that we needed to use data analysis methods to try and estimate the uh, asymptomatic period from this, the data giving these, um, these unknowns. So we used two, two, we, we used two methods, a parametric method called Kaplan-Meier, um, and uh, sorry, a non-parametric method called Kaplan-Meier and a parametric method where we assumed an exponential distribution so that there was a constant rate of symptom development. And um, you can see uh, the, the results here for um, different host and subspecies combinations. But all in all, um, what we found was that the uh, asymptomatic periods were highly variable depending on the host and subspecies combinations that in general um, almond infected with multiplex um, and orange and olive infected with palca showed the longer asymptomatic periods um, but the uncertainties we need to bear in mind with this is that this was we were fitting two data um, there may have been some symptomless hosts that would affect our, our estimates um, there's questions about inoculation success so if something wasn't symptomatic, we assume that inoculation was successful, but it may not have been. And the studies were restricted mainly to, to young plants. But it shows something about the, the amount of variability and the, the, the long asymptomatic period that Xylella is capable of and that, that people, the people are aware of. And that has obviously huge implications for our ability to uh, detect Xylella in, in the field. And Alex Maston will talk uh, a little bit about the consequences of this for surveillance um, for Xylella at 11 o'clock uh, this morning. But it can be used to help inform surveillance strategies depending on the, the, the host and the, the um, subspecies that, that you're facing. So the next part of the work I want to uh, summarize is the risk of establishment. So this was led by uh, Juan Antonio Navas, and he showed some of this uh, yesterday. So um, these were ensemble species distribution models. The, the disease data was taken from the EFSA host plant database and also from national uh, MPPO um, records. There's, he looks at 19 different bioclimatic variables um, and on the basis of that predicts potential establishment across the, the EU. So the map here shows climatic suitability for xylella at a species level and that is where most of the data is available because um, many studies, especially some of the older studies, will only report xylella at the species level so it's not possible to look at it um, be below that. But you can see that what it, what it shows is that there's, um, the risk is highest basically in, in southern areas um, of Europe when we consider at the, the species level. Juan also looked at um, it subspecies level and there we can see some differences. So for example, this is um, multiplex and what we find is that there is increased risk of establishment in northern areas of Europe when we, we look at something like multiplex. But what isn't shown on this map is the uncertainty and the uncertainty increases quite, um, quite dramatically when you go down to subspecies level just because of the data um, availability. 
So the key conclusions from this were that most, most of the EU territories are estimated to have some level of um, climatic risk based on the, the available data, but Southern Europe in, in general more at risk. Multiplex has um, the, was the subspecies that had risk further north in Europe. Um, and that this can be an important tool for design of surveys, as in fact we saw in some of the talks yesterday in terms of risk targeted um, surveys. But there are still some uncertainties in this in terms of um, the data, so it uh, assumes that um, the, the data are unbiased in terms of where the reports are coming from. Um, but it might be that xylella where it's lower impact, uh, there's an underreporting of data and a higher reporting of data where there's uh, more impact felt and this would um, perhaps influence some of the, the results. So it, I think it, what it emphasizes is the need for, often we're collecting data um, in, for one purpose, which is because we're responding to, to um, an emerging um, problem and we're driven by where, finding new outbreaks and trying to control them. But I think, the, uh, as we saw yesterday in the modeling talks, this need for also a component of that monitoring to be um, more widespread uh, representative surveys helps with this sort of um, information. The next aspect was um, spread, and we looked at spread in two components, so short-range spread and long-range spread. Um, and that was because there are different epidemiological processes at these two different spatial scales, and it's difficult to combine those into a, a single model. So this short-range spread was the work uh, led by uh, Gianni uh, Giulioli, who presented yesterday, so I won't describe his model in, in too much detail, except to say that he keeps track of the infected vectors and the uh, disease and how that changes uh, across space and time um, in uh, a situation of uh, in olive orchards. And then what he can do is then use, want, want to have a model of how xylella spreads at that, at that spatial scale. Uh, we can use that to look at the consequences of different um, management and eradication strategies. And some of the key conclusions from this, so. Um, in each scenario, we looked at um, there was either 50 meters control radius used or 100 meters. Um, and then we looked at different situations, so high vector control, low vector control. What happens when you have early detection of the outbreaks? What happens when you have late detection? And what happens when you have early instigation of the control measures? Uh, so that's the time from detection until control measures are implemented. And we could look at these different scenarios and different combinations of them and which ones were, were eradication possible under and which uh, were they not. And a key conclusion was that um, in almost all cases for eradication to be possible, there had to be high vector control. And the only situation where that wasn't the case, um, there needed all the other control measures needed to be at their, their highest, so 100 meters control radius, early detection, early instigation um, of control measures. So this was a short range model. So the caveats are that it, it's not looking at long distance jumps. It's looking at that local um, uh, expansion of disease foci. Um, but under scenario, under, under um, those circumstances, the, the model suggests that the reduction in transmission through control of, of vectors was the most important factor. But in each case, we always assumed that there was um, either 50 meters or 100 meter control radius used. Um, early detection, early instigation of uh, control measures was important. Um, there were some situations where local eradication could be achieved with a 50 meter radius. However, not even a 100 meter radius could achieve eradication where there was um, low vector control and slow detection um, and these sorts of things. So the, the next um, model was the long range spread model that was um, work that was led by Dan Chapman and Stephen White uh, and Dan presented his model um, yesterday or the, 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 the latest version of that, that model. Um, 
So what you can see here is just some illustrative examples. So these uh, of um, the the model spread, just to show what 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 the sort of this model um, looks like. But it's including information on the landscape distribution, so the the distribution of hosts in the landscape, the rate of uh, local increase in the infection, and um, the dispersal of the of the um, disease. And these are some of the, uh, the results from, uh, from that model when it's used to look at eradication and containment strategies um, under different sort of um, assumptions. So we uh, looked at different landscape configurations that were typical of uh, different outbreak areas in, in Europe and um, found not too much difference in the effectiveness of different measures to them. In general, reducing a buffer zone size increased the amount of infected area. Um, increasing the buffer zone size reduced infected area, but there was a, um, a diminishing return um, associated with that. So obviously the larger the buffer zone, the, more, the, the better you're gonna do in terms of controlling the epidemic. But the, what the model can show is how that return diminishes as you um, increase. It influenced again the importance of early detection through high in inspection rates and also um, strong uh, vector control. So there were some similarities in terms of the conclusions with, with both models. So um, the, the model su suggested vector control uh, in combination with the surveys was um, the eff effective in terms of um, reducing the, uh, the epidemic. And then finally, just quickly, um, we also looked at assessment of impacts, but I don't have much uh, time, I think, to describe that. Um, but we looked at expert knowledge elicitation for um, estimating impact in some hosts and in others. We used a literature review approach where there was less information available. Um, and also um, at a range of risk reduction options, um, but importantly, none of which showed that there were methods currently available that could really eliminate xylella from uh, host plants. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> we have time for questions. <laughs> so, I have one, according to your experience, I, ha I know that you have been working really hard all the, all the group. What was the most uh, difficult part to modelize or to, to get data or, or to, to, to get uh, some conclusion? Ooh, okay. <laughs> I think everyone will say their part was the, the hardest. <laughs> um, but now you, you have the, the possibility to, 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 to choose. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do. I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to say. I think. I think across the across the board, there was. Uh, we were constantly faced with difficulties with data uh, availability. Um, so I think you know. In general, I guess a message from this is that there is more, still more work needed. So there's obviously a, a lot of research being done, a lot of data being collected, but still a lot of uncertainties. Um, I think really across the board. My diplomatic answer for the working group. <laughs> I will do the question in a different way. So if you can choose to tell the scientists, the people that do the, really w the work at the lab or at the field, uh, wh where the focus should be uh, placed. Uh, okay. okay. So I can give you my biased answer to that. So I think um, for, for me, it's the, the, there's a huge monitoring efforts go in when, when we have outbreaks like Xylella, but also other pathosystems, huge. Um, monitoring efforts and I, I think um, they're obviously for a certain purpose but I think if and, and often then quite targeted and it then makes it uh, it's difficult to then infer information on things like the dispersal scale of the pathogen from that data I mean, and it's logical that it's it, that it's collected for that that purpose but I think you know when there is a situation where there is then a, a sudden large monitoring effort um, having a subset of that monitoring effort which is more representative um, data collection and less targeted is, is helpful in terms of understanding the epidemiology. Questions? 
No? Okay, so we will pass to our next speaker. Thank you. So our next speaker is Kevin Schneider from Wageningen University, and he will talk about the potential impact of Silella fastidiosa subspecies pauca in the European olives uh, uh, bioeconomic analysis. Good morning, everyone. I will be presenting joint work that was developed within Work Package 8 of Ponte. And in this presentation, we're dealing with some economic assessment. The objective of the study was to provide a first exploration of the potential direct economic impact of Xylella fastidiosa on the European olive production. We approach this in four steps. First, we predict the climatic suitable territory in Europe. For this, we make use of the exact same map that Stephen just showed. It was published in the last update of the scientific opinion. However, for all purposes, we need to convert this to a binary prediction, so indicating whether a given location is suitable or not. And in this step, we also include spatially explicit information on olive production sites in Europe. Next, we simulate the spread of the disease of a, over time horizons of 50 years. And lastly, we estimate the economic impact due to the pathogen. I also would like to use this opportunity to express my gratitude towards EFSA. Over the course of working on this analysis, we've experienced a quite open and supportive exchange of knowledge, in particular the climatic suitability map but also the spread rate we use for our model um, is based on the last update of the scientific opinion. And in particular, the latter severely improved the analysis, I believe. So I do not want to go into much detail here. Stephen just presented this. Uh, it is the same map that is used in the update of the scientific opinion. Various species distribution models were computed that all predict the area of potential establishment for Xylella fastidiosa in Europe. Essentially, they all try to find correlations between occurrence and environmental factors. And instead of just relying on one methodology, an assembled prediction is generated by the different results, taking the relative model performance into account. For the purpose of this map, various data were used, mostly on pathogen occurrence, but also a very rich climate data set that spans several decades. The, the output of this map is a continuous score between zero and one for every location in Europe. To convert this continuous sc score into a binary map, so indicating suitable or not suitable, we make use of three thresholds that are also described in the last update of the scientific opinion from EFSA. I do not want to go into detail here into the different thresholds, but they all in essence have to do with model performance. The spatial explicit information on olive production sites in Europe was obtained from the Corinne land cover map. We modeled spread of the disease over a time horizon of 50 years following a radial range expansion. What this means is we have a point of origin and then at every discrete annual time step we have an expanding cycle around that point. All the olive cells that are suitable within that circle are assumed to be infected. As a starting point, we take the currently classified infected zone in Apulia. And we then simulate spread beyond that zone. Hence, we assume that the containment efforts has, have failed and the pathogen disperses into other parts of Europe. The model only has one parameter, which is called the rate of ready range expansion. And it determines the, the, the size of the expanding circle at every year. For this parameter, we make use of the by EFSA elicited distribution on the mean distance of disease spread. You see by the quantiles I list that the distribution is quite large, so there's quite some uncertainty regarding the annual spread of the disease. We make use of three quantiles 
The 5% quantile corresponds to a 1.1 kilometer range. The most likely rate it was estimated to be 5.18 kilometer, and the fastest rate we model is 12.35 kilometer per year. In terms of economics, we compute impacts for Italy, Spain, and Greece, because these countries stem around 95% of the European olive oil production. Within every country, we model six cropping systems. The systems differ in the tree densities per hectare and whether or not they are irrigated or rain-fed. Country-specific data on the distribution of the national area of production into these different cropping systems was obtained from Eurostat. And the different systems differ in economically relevant parameters such as the full bearing yield, the operational costs, the establishment costs of an orchard, as well as the longevity of the system. We compute economic impacts based on two terms. The first one is called profit foregone. It is essentially the profits that are not generated due to the presence of the pathogen. We assume quite conservatively, I believe, that yields decrease at a rate of 10% for every year under infection, with the first year being latent. Costs increase for every year under infection, also at the rate of 10%, due to, for example, additional effort on pruning and vector control. The second term we capture is termed lost investment, and this requires a little bit of an explanation. The different cropping systems have different establishment costs for the orchard per hectare. Instead of modeling these costs as a one-time payment, we transform them into annual equivalent costs that then span the lifetime of the orchard, at least the expected lifetime of the orchard, also taking into account the discount rate. If an orchard now dies at the age of 50 and the farmer was expecting it to reach at least the age of 75, then 25 periods of these annuities are effectively lost, and this is what we refer to as lost investment. These impacts are computed for two economic scenarios that intend to bracket the likely impact. The worst case scenario is one in which production is ceasing once the orchards die off. The best case scenario is one where farmers are able to replant with a resistant variety that essentially produces the same profits as the susceptible equivalents and is completely resistant to the pathogen. The total damage over 50 years is then computed as present value. Going into the results, what you see here is an illustration of Italy. The different shading of red show you the different climatic suitability thresholds we use to convert a continuous map into a binary map. The darker colors comprise also of the areas with the lighter color. And what you see in blue is the olive sales after the Korean land cover map. What we found was that the percent of the national area of production within climatically suitable territory for xylella is not very sensitive to the different thresholds. In Italy, this share ranged from 92% to 95%. In Greece and Spain, the share was similarly large, although in Spain the results were a bit more sensitive. In terms of spread, what we see is that the uncertainty in the annual dispersal translates quite sensitively into the share of the national area of infection that is invaded at the end of the time horizon. To illustrate this a little bit, on the left side, you see the 5% quantile, in the middle, the 50% quantile, and on the right side, the 95% quantile. In green, you see healthy but susceptible olive cells, in red, you see invaded olive cells, and in gray, you see non-suitable area. This is the situation at year five. As I indicated before, we model spread beyond the current extent. At year 25, differences start to emerge. And in year 50, you see a very large difference between the different spread scenarios. So while the 5% quantile barely reached beyond the current extent, the 95% uh, quantile reached all other cells in the south of Italy and also spans far into the north, which is not plotted here. 
In terms of economics, I want to stress one point. The numerical results between the different climatic suitability thresholds were not very different, which is why I omitted them from the table to improve readability. So what you see here is every row is a different spread scenario in terms of speed using the same climatic suitability threshold. The first two columns show the scenario where replanting is not possible. Total impacts comprise of profit foregone and the losses in investment. The middle two columns depict the scenarios where, where replanting is feasible. What we see is that present values over 50 years, if replanting is not feasible, range between 2.4 and 7.4 billion euros. The majority of which was due to the absence of profits that would have been generated. If replanting is feasible, these profits, uh, these impacts are reduced to around 800 million up to 2.9 billion euros over the course of 50 years. The difference between the total impacts approximates what we term the benefit of resistant orchards. Before I continue, I want to also stress one point. Even if we assume a very slow rate of dispersal and we have an economic best case where farmers are able to replant immediately after the orchards die off, we still get quite sizable impacts of around 800 million in net present values. So what do we learn from this analysis? We found that impacts do not critically depend on the uncertainty about climatic limits, at least when it comes to the different thresholds we use. The uncertainty in the annual rate of dispersal, however, sensitively influenced the total impacts. This allows us to also make comparison between the different spread rates. So if we assume that indeed the 5.18 kilometer per year is the most likely case, and researchers are able to reduce this annual spread to around 1.1 kilometer, the model suggested economic benefits that range between around 600 million if replanting is feasible, up to 1.6 billion over the course of 50 years if replanting is not feasible. I think this speaks for the importance of vector control, host removal, and other means of controlling the annual dispersal rate. We found a clear benefit of resistant orchards that potentially sizes billions of euros, albeit that we do not model alternative cropping decisions that farmers might take. Unfortunately, we found that irrespectively of the rate of expansion and our quite conservative economic assumptions, impacts were always sizable and can certain, certainly be classified as unacceptable. To give you a little bit of a background which assumptions I'm talking about, if you think that uh, these figures are large, you have to imagine that the entire analysis is on the olive stage, not on the olive oil stage. Profit margins in the olive oil productions are larger. In turn, the profits foregone would be larger and impacts would be larger as a result. Another quite conservative assumption is that uh, we are acutely aware of the fact that we suggest a best case scenario where hundreds of thousands of hectares of olive trees are effectively replanted with young trees. Completely ignoring the fact that many of the trees are decades old, if not hundreds of years old. So there's a cultural heritage value to the trees that is not taken into account in this analysis. Lastly, we assume that all the farmers are financially capable to replant. Unfortunately, this is likely not the case in reality. In particular, for the last point, the analysis also revealed that replanting resistant orchards will result in a sizable period spanning up to a decade where farmers have to incur costs in terms of labor and productive inputs, but they will not experience any profits because trees are not yet full bearing. If the regulators want to ensure that these three countries remain at the global lead of olive oil production, there might be the need to provide financial support for farmers that are keen to transition to a resistant population. To conclude, we derive insights from modeling work on climatic suitability, potential spread of the disease beyond the current extent, and economics, irrespectively of the rate of dispersal and irrespectively of the economic scenario, impacts were always sizable, and there warrant actions from regulators and the public. 
I would like to end this on a more positive note. I think the analysis also reveals the potential economic savings that could, can be secured if the spread rate is reduced. I think this speaks for the societal value of the work that has been produced within Ponte and that will be produced within XFactors in the next years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. We have time for questions. Hi, uh, apologies if I missed this. Uh, sorry, Stephen White, CH. Um, uh, where did you get your values from? So did you have like a per grid cell value? for? So I was looking at the table of costs that you come up uh, with. Where did they come from? So the economic parameters you refer to, they were gathered from the literature. There's an uh, olive oil farm report from the European Commission that provides some profit margins, uh, price data. Um, the longevity of the systems was obtained from agronomic literature, the replanting costs as well. Uh, they were also reported for different tree densities per hectare. So uh, this is where the economic data came from. Thank you. Yep. Questions? Okay. Hi, thank you for a very nice talk. Do, um, so you talked about replanting uh, olives um, or not replanting. Did you consider planting something else than olives? Yeah, this was one of the main struggles we faced um, due to the fact that we were asked to provide a continental assessment estimating which plants will be replanted at which location, whether farmers cease production and go into a different industry, whether they plant forestry or whether they go into an maybe an annual plant, it's very difficult. So this is why we opted for this alternative that in essence brackets the worst case from the best case for all the spread scenarios. But I guess ideally we would have more insights into which alternative crops would be available for the farmers that suffer infection. I have one question. Uh, how difficult or how easy will it be to extrapolate this uh, analysis to the situation, for instance, in Alicante, that, as you know, the, mo the most important crop uh, affected is salmon. I think the framework is very well suitable to do more regional assessments as well. Uh, it just would need to have different parameter values that can be tailored more to the regional um, circumstances. In a way, this would actually make it easier because a continental assessment requires simplifications. And um, if we have not two data available on the economics, it would be quite straightforward to, to use this framework also for a regional assessment. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, we will pass to... <laughs> now we will pass to our next speakers. We have two, two people now. Uh, Berta Sanchez uh, from the Joint Research Center and Olaf uh, Moshbat Schulz from the European Food Safety Authority. So they will talk about estimating the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the European Priority Pest, a joint project for EFSA and Joint Research Center at the case study of Chile La Fastidiosa. So you will combine. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Ola. <laughs> um, this is a joint project that we did uh, between EFSA and GSC. So, it's going to be a joint presentation as has to be. And uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, this uh, two year project where we estimated the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the Euro European Union priority pest. And uh, we will try to give a specific uh, focus on Silela fastidiosa. So I would like to start my presentation quoting uh, a presentation from yesterday that uh, I really like. I, I didn't understand a lot because it was about genetics and, and agricultural economics, 
But I was happy when he said this uh, sentence. I will quote him for the conclusions. Uh, questions need to be generated first and then adequate data must be collected. I think it uh, summarized very well our project. So our main question uh, was how to establish European Union wide priorities when resources are limited. So I think everybody here has the same problem. <laughs> so in, under the new plan health uh, law, 20 quarantine pests, including Xylella, have been, have been listed as priority pests. And it was, uh, this prioritization was based on their most severe economic, environmental, and social impact for the Union territory. Uh, actually, this uh, priority pest will be subject to several provisions and obligations under the law for more intensive uh, surveys, uh, more simulation exercises, and uh, contingency plans. So um, here we are a representation of uh, all the people that uh, was working in this uh, joint uh, project. Um, to determine this list of priority pests, the Commission, particularly DG Sante, um, undertook an assessment, and this uh, joint methodology on priority pests was the basis for uh, the assessment to select the list of priority pests. And uh, a good thing of our methodology is uh, that uh, we integrated economics and pathology. You can see uh, the GRC report and, and the EFSA report, I think uh, for EFSA they have more, more information and uh, both are open access and you can, if you are interested, access uh, through the web. So, another question. <laughs> How to rank best based on economic, social, and environmental impact? Well, for this project, we develop a composite indicator, including multiple criteria. Um, our uh, indicator is uh, the impact indicator for priority pests and uh, we call it the I2P2. First, we translated the regulation criteria that uh, determines the economic, social, and environmental impact into measure measurable indicators at the European level. And then we reached a list of 25 indicators. Uh, second, we made uh, assumptions and principles for the analysis in collaboration with uh, EFSA. We have a lot of discussions to, to understand how to make the analysis. And um, one of our main assumptions for this uh, project is the maximum spread of all the pests that we analyzed. But all of we will talk about uh, later about that. And finally, we aggregate all these 25 indicators into one single composite index measure that is the key to make a ranking. So we have a, a, a measure by uh, each pest, and then based on a lot of information, data and analysis, and then we can make a ranking, compare different pests, or give uh, informed policy choices. Uh, for the calculation of uh, our indicators, we have to, to collect mm, different uh, data from different sources. So, most important, EFSA provided a lot of information on the biodiversity and the pathogen, but all of we will talk about that in a few minutes. And uh, we also collected secondary data uh, from official statistics and scientific literature, for example, on production, trade, um, environmental parameters. And uh, also, we had to, to make an ad hoc uh, data request for those data that uh, had mm, limited availability. For example, some data on forestry. We also consult Peter Beck. I mean, there, for sure, there are many people in the room that provided uh, us with some feedback, so I, I uh, appreciate the help. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, when we collected all this data and we prepared a data, a data set, we estimated the 25 indicators for all the best uh, analyzed. Uh, well, 
this is the, the structure of the I2P2, of the impact indicator for priority pest. And as you can see, we have these uh, 25 indicators that uh, were reached according to the regulation criteria. So we cover different, different subdomains uh, to estimate the production impacts, the trade impacts, price effects, impact in um, downstream and upstream sectors. Uh, we also have uh, um, domains uh, for social impact, like uh, employment loss or environmental and uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services. But in the case of Silela, when we compare in the ranking Silela with the other uh, pests affecting crops, um, that uh, when we compare Silela with all these pests, uh, it ranked first in 11 out of the 25 indicators. And uh, when we compare Silela by domains, always rank like the worst, the first. <laughs> and now I think Olaf is going to talk. Good morning also from my side. Uh, as Berta told you, uh, EFSA was supporting this project by the plant health information. And so uh, our question was related to the pests, how to compare these pests. And the task was really to, to look for 28 different pests. So we had 17 insects, uh, six bacteria, fungi, and one nematode. Um, and the easiest thing is to uh, put together the information about pathology and taxonomy. And so this is the start for what we call the pest report. In fact, we produced 28 pest reports, one for each pest. The second point we were looking at were trying to make a full list of uh, impacted hosts by including information from EPO, CABI, and as a pest risk assessment from member states and EFSA. Um, and then already the first step of simplification had to be done because when these two models come together, we have to see what uh, uh, JRC was able to put into the economic analysis. So we defined uh, uh, important host categories and you can see we were looking to 14 food trees, eight vegetables or legumes, four cereals, four ornamentals and eight forest trees. And in fact, this matrix which appear there has now to be filled. Um, the, no, sorry, one point is before the area of uh, establishment we were looking, we were looking to a NUTS2 level to find the information. We were also looking which Natura 2000 sites were affected by the pest, what's happening with transient population and where glass houses might be affected. And, um, Additionally, there were one question on the use of uh, additional or the additional use of pesticide. We looked in these four categories you can see on the slide. Um, there are two categories with no impact in the sense that in the first there is no, uh, no plant protection product available to go against the pest, so there will be no additional use. The second one, the common practice is uh, uh, efficient, so again, no additional use. We assume that there is some additional use of plant protection products. And then the last category turned out as the most important, that the pest is so uh, complicated to manage that integrated strategies will be needed. So coming back to the table, and here you see the cells we have to fill for Xylella. So one bacteria, mainly fruit trees. Uh, we were looking to quantitative values to put these into the economic analysis. We were looking to yield and quality loss, and uh, we were looking to difficulty of eradication. And that means the spread rate and the time uh, to detection and after entry. And you could imagine when you have now to fill this whole table with 28 paths and these different crop categories, um, that it's a quite challenging task to do so. So we need some simplification. The simplification were done by doing scenarios. So going for a specific situation, which is a little bit artificial, but harmonize the situation 
to allow comparison between the different test host categories. And the first scenario was given by the legislation. We have to look for the maximum impact scenario, and that means we don't look to entry. The pest is already present throughout the area of potential establishment. It's established in an equilibrium situation. We go for the yield loss as average of the production system to harmonize annual production from orchards with a long lifetime. And we disregard future changes in the management. So we are just applying the current practice. And under this condition, we were asking ourselves, what will be the maximum yield loss? The second scenario, the scenario for difficulty of eradication, is uh, different in the sense that we are starting with a uh, isolated focus with a small population just established and we look for a short distance dispersal which in our case is a mixture of natural dispersal and human activities related to agricultural practice but not related to trade and not related to other effects like hitchhiking etc. The last uh, um, condition in this scenario is that we assume hosts are always available, so that means, in principle, we don't look to landscape effects or uh, uh, effects of the vegetation. The assessment method starts quite simple. So on the right side, so you see our workflow. We made a, created a workflow to be fair to all the pests and have the same assessment strategies for all the 28 pests. And we started, of course, with a review and summary of the PRAs and literatures, where we got pathology, host plants, and potential distribution. But for the quantification, we used the methodology which is developed in EFSA, and it's a structured expert judgment, or in our terminology, it's called expert knowledge elicitation. And uh, this means we invite experts to have a structured interview and uh, we were asking them for the estimates, but additionally also the uncertainties for the values of yield loss, spread rate, uh, and time to detection. Uh, to harmonize the whole approach, two experts were following all the elicitation, all 28 pests. For the rest, uh, we invited specialists, and in total, 52 experts were invited for the project. And now let's have a look to the results. Um, but before I start, I have to say um, this structured interview gives quantitative results and they are needed for modeling approach and they were used also before in the other talks, what you heard this morning. But it delivers also a detailed reasoning on the damage and especially low and high risk scenarios. Okay, the results are these wonderful curves and first of all, you can't see the details, but I will take you, this is a median for uh, stone fruit production and uh, festered with sulella, and you see the highest values are old olive trees and uh, young olive trees below 30 years, and the almonds are already in the middle. Each curve corresponds to uh, one host pest system. When you would take this uh, horizontal line up, you would go for a more precautionary approach. This year we call the fair solution, which is not over or underestimating the yield loss. And now I can continue. You find this for citrus fruits, and you see other pests are in the citrus system uh, more important when you go for grapes. Again, other lines are more to the right, so give higher yield loss. For difficulty of eradication, um, xylella is in the upper uh, third of all the pests, but in the lower upper part, for time to detection, we find it in the middle. And now I give the floor back to Berta for the economic part. So, thank you, Olaf. I think we are sort of time, so I will go fast. Uh, some of the results of our indicators for the Silela fastidiosa, uh, we estimated a loss of production for the European Union based on the EFSA parameter on uh, 5.5 5, 5 billion euros per year, uh, mainly on the in the Mediterranean areas, and uh, the analysis was for this uh, for uh, host 
and uh, the damage was uh, mostly for olive trees production. We estimated a European Union, uh, a potential European Union export losses of 0 0.7 billion euros per year. And I like this uh, slide because I was uh, speaking yesterday with uh, people from Italy and Alicante, and I think it's very important to understand that the, the cost of the damage of Silera fastidiosa is 1,000 times higher than the cost of surveillance. And I think awareness campaigns and surveillance and activities are very important. And for the social cost of Silela fastidiosa, uh, we estimated about uh, nearly 3,000 jobs involved in production. Um, we estimated that 70 agricultural products covered by European Union quality labels, like, for example, geographical indications, can be susceptible to Silela fastidiosa or related to host susceptible to Silela fastidiosa, and more than 18 different plant species susceptible to Silera fastidiosa are part of different UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are distributed, uh, distributed all across European Union. And finally, for the environmental cost of Silela fastidiosa and according to the full spread and according to the tables that uh, was uh, all of showing, um, we estimated a potential increase of insecticide uh, spraying to control the vector and uh, over 24 habitats and 20 species species that are associated to host susceptible of infection by Silella fastidiosa and that uh, the, they are included in the, the directed directives of habitats, habitats and, and birds. Uh, thank you for your attention. So we have time for questions. Uh, in your last conclusion, you, you indicate that it, it is uh, assumed that it will increase the uh, cost of pesticide use, but currently uh, each year there is a decrease in the number of in insecticides that can be used. So how do you think this can be uh, combined? The need to, to maybe treat the, the vector, but uh, with less availability of products? How do you... I'm, I'm not a plant health expert, but I think uh, in, in most of the cases we were discussing that you need uh, systematic strategies, so it will be not only on the pesticide level. Questions? Okay. So we pass uh, to our last uh, speaker. So, Christian Colella from the University of Milano, Bicocca. Uh, he will talk about the living with Silela, the dynamics of knowledge uh, within Silela fastidiosa, and the sociopathosystems in Puglia and Corsica. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, this is increasing in numbers of people. So, th there will be four. Uh, please uh, take a seat. <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay, so this is a surprise. It will be a kind of round table, and you will be the chair, okay? <laughs> so when you have uh, two minutes, uh, I will stay here, and you know that you have to organize, okay? So, good morning everybody. So, uh, we are going to make something which is uh, quite normal, which is sharing uh, our scientific work in the two situations that you know very well, in Puglia and Corsica. And we are social scientists. We decided to congregate our work and see how it could go if we would like to compare the dynamics of knowledge due to the 
axillella fastidiosa, uh, emergence, and what we call a sociopath system, meaning to include uh, a social perspective uh, in, these, in the studies uh, uh, of uh, the emergence uh, of axillella. So, uh, next, uh, I just put this. So, it's two case studies. We discovered also recently that in Balear it would be a very, very uh, interesting case studies. We'll, we'll perhaps talk about it in the discussion. So, our research questions are just quite simple at the beginning. We wanted to compare and enter also the idea that what could be done with the introduction of social studies of the emergence uh, 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 among other types of knowledge that have been reported during this conference or in conferences before. So we know that, and we saw it this morning, the, the social science are um, very much welcome to contribute to specifically impact and risk assessments, also in terms of acceptability of innovation on specific measures and also in communication. But uh, our view is also because of our empirical work was to notice that a lot of uh, social factors are, so to say, committed, con taking part to the outbreaks and to the way the outbreaks also are managed. And from the EFSA to the local authority, these actors are precisely involved in both the biotic aspects, the climatological aspect, but also with the social aspects of this emergence. So for us, the idea was trying to see, okay, what can be said by social science when we study empirically these emergences, this uh, situation of emergence, and what could be then the, the outcomes of our research taking this comparative, comparative uh, point of view. So let's now, and I will pass the, mess, so the, the mic to, uh, to Fiona Panzera. Um, so we present, as we said, can we pass to the other slides, please? Um, we present a reflection based on several surveys which were not aimed at the beginning to be compared when they were settled. Therefore, it's an ad hoc reflection. However, all surveys um, have been led with a similar uh, qualitative methodology that allowed this dialogue. What uh, and this methodology include participative observation, uh, in-depth interview, and synchronic and diachronic analysis. Uh, you might find here an example of a scheme we build to understand what is happening on the field. And uh, all this survey uh, have already produced uh, some scientific publication and outputs uh, in several uh, disciplines. Uh, sciences and technologies studies, uh, anthropology and management. And uh, this allowed us, us also to contribute uh, actively in research project, project um, <coughs> uh, with a participatory approach and to contribute to scientific expert committees. Okay, so now I just want to give you a quick taste of what does it mean uh, on the field uh, uh, living uh, the, the way of being of this social phenomena, which uh, can be understood as biological phenomena, but it appears to be more than this. Um, at first, this plant issue become a political and legal issue uh, and uh, concern. Uh, it become to it become possible to find it appearing in political debates. Uh, and, and plant owners are threatened by penal laws. Uh, policemen can be asked to, sur uh, to supervise some eradication. And it can also happen, as I uh, show here, that scientific and um, uh, 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 sanitary agents working on those uh, emergency uh, are criminalized too. Um, but quite simul uh, simultaneously, uh, it became an issue of building boundaries and uh, an issue of economical concerns. Uh, I give you here uh, as an example of uh, all the Corsican con concerned about the Italian outbreaks. 
And this concern, you have here several uh, newspaper titles which are really uh, freaking out about what is happening in Italy. And these have been uh, a, very, uh, a very active uh, push on for uh, the discovery of the French outbreak. Um, but quarantine measure uh, will also move lines uh, in concerned area and then become a vector of social change. Uh, people executed, uh, execute extraordinary uh, measure to control the epiphytia, like this fireman in Corsica, you see. Um, but some people with oppose themselves to the uh, quarantine measure. And here I put you uh, an Italian tract accusing Silela sanitary measure to be illegal. Um, some interests will be threatened, uh, the, the OLEAR production in Apulia, uh, and uh, a new group will appear. In Italia, you have the people of the olive tree, the voice of the olive tree. In Corsica, you will have the Committee Antic Silella, and, um, and so on. Then people will speak about it. And at last but not least, people affected by my uh, face, uh, people affected my face woos. And um, there is a need for them to make those woos uh, to make sense and to be uh, put uh, in a current in currents with their understanding of the word. So that might uh, uh, be made through complotism. Uh, uh, understandment. This can be uh, made through religious or spiritual uh, way and um, scientific too are facing uh, some uh, woes and I've put you here uh, on the left side uh, a joke that an Italian scientist I've proposed to uh, his colleague scientists to uh, put distance between all the accusations it was uh, against them uh, in order to uh, keep going on. Um, and then I pass the mic. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to um, present the first results, uh, please. <coughs> uh, so to deal with um, the comprehension of the um, disease management strategies, we had first to build uh, one of the, our first results, the building of a general, general frame of the um, of management because managers are uh, reflexive people and they don't uh, take decision uh, they take decision according to many and many factors including here there are some examples wh what we call frameworks or context there are lots of contexts uh, they take, take they take decision on, on, the, on their understandings of, the, of uh, this context. So, um, for example, of course, we take decision uh, according to the legal framework, the text of laws, the knowledge production, the evolution of knowledge uh, had consequences of, of the evolution of the management strategy, etc., etc. And each of these contexts interact also with each other. So, I will present here. We will present here uh, our comparison of the two cases on only three of these contexts, uh, please. <coughs> so the, what we call axis or layers, uh, the legal and the regulation layers, how Xilela fastidiosa is framed in official texts, in discourse, et cetera, et cetera. For example, the, um, the, the official plant host list, uh, which framed the strategies in different territories. Uh, the no knowledge production layers, in the evolution of this knowledge, for example, when we detected the presence of Felinus primarius in Corsica, it, has, it had consequences on the strategy. And the stakeholders' response and movements layer, it's the social movement, we could say, what Fiona just described, from the mistrust in the authorities, the fact that people protest, or etc. Manager won't take a uh, decision in the same way uh, according to the, the, this context. So, um, please, so our comparison, um, okay, the situation are very different, uh, Puglia and Corsica, it's, uh, but when we uh, put um, a synthetic chronology of the two situation, of the, the evolution of the strategy, we uh, see some similarities. Uh, so this is the, the, uh, this, uh, what shows uh, this slide. So quickly, uh, we can see that in two cases, we, we started with an eradication strategy and we ended with a, 
a containment strategy and a situation where uh, people try to live with the Xilela in the territory. And we follow steps in this uh, evolution. We, uh, in each situation, there was negotiation to try to change the management settings to negotiate about the zoning of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, in Corsica, it's uh, the third, um, the third maps. We see a proposition uh, that was made to cut Corsica in two with infected area in the south, uh, free area in the, in the north, and with a, a buffer zone in the middle. And it's, it's not uh, based on epidemiological knowledge, based on social, economical, and technical comprehension of the situation. Um, and we see in this... Uh, <laughs> Okay, um, and so what we try to show here in the evolution of the and the interaction between the different context frameworks, in blue it's a legal, yellow knowledge, re, uh, green um, um, the stakeholders movement, and we see for example that uh, during the phase where we were in eradication strategy, when we identified multiplex uh, the subspecies multiplex on Polygala, it has uh, several consequences. It changed the manner we manage uh, the situation. For, for example, it led to the hypothesis of, on, of uh, vertical contamination, and uh, it led with the, uh, to um, a prefectoral act uh, searching to uh, eradicate polygala and not uh, uh, polygala multifolia. And uh, there are several consequences on uh, stakeholder movement also. I won't go in any further in the detail, and I'll pass the, the microphone to Christian. So we see as um, knowledge, knowledge creation is strictly interlocked with uh, policy making uh, yeah. and of course stakeholders reaction. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I'll go to into the detail of the, bri very briefly in the, for all concerned, the, 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 the case of uh, uh, Xela in, uh, in Puglia. Um, well, we assist a very different scenario in, uh, in Italy, but nonetheless is still comparable for a certain aspect uh, that we are discussing. So um, a new pathology um, affecting the olive trees in Apulia started to be at the center of uh, farmers' preoccupation and soon became the object of a scientific investigation. We immediately assist to the unfolding of a different range of uh, interesting processes. So um, researchers at the beginning found out find, uh, the, in these trees uh, there were a, a concomitance of uh, different factors, fungi, insect, uh, and xylella fastidiosa. And, and this, is, this last factor is definitely different from the other because it does not only produce research, but it also produces policies. Um, and even regardless uh, of the plant pathology to which is correlated, um, and so the first process that we can discern uh, is a, a, a strict political process. Um, but even if we stay within the scientific process, this plant pathology created a um, different path of research um, and continue to be interesting. Um, so is Xarella the only aseological factor or maybe there are other factors involved? Um, and and the, the process of uh, uh, pathologization became public, um, and it was discussed by um, uh, local newspaper, then national newspaper, then television, then uh, infotainment programs, uh, and so on. Of course, um, well, the the experts with experience on xylella became a process of narrowing down the object. Um, so we know xylella, we know the, that affect olive trees. Um, we, we, we have to find a vector, um, and um, they, they, they proceed by applying the, the triad, bacterium host vector. Um, but then organized socio-environmental socio movement appears to the scene, and, and, and begin to criticizing the knowledge of the triad, uh, and saying that uh, more research was needed outside the triad. And even, even some, at the beginning, even some researchers the, believe that, and still now. Um, and, and well, they ended up manufacturing a completely different pathology, um, a completely uh, a complex of causes that were not only biotic or abiotic, but also social, cultural, and political. 
um, well, the, public, the pathology station was public at that point, at, at the point that uh, the judge entered into the scientific field, uh, framing differently uh, what is needed to be known and what is not needed to be known about the plant pathology. Uh, well, fast forward to recent uh, years, uh, maybe more serene times from this point of view, um, other problems uh, emerge. So uh, what are the future we can imagine from, uh, for uh, a post Xylella Apulia? Um, uh, are the plans for uh, reconstruction going to work? Or uh, what might be the terms of the new natural contract for Puglia? And more importantly, who will be the co-signatories? So slide, the other slide, okay, conclusion. So uh, is the pathosystem uh, Xylella really defined only by the elements of its triad? Um, the triad is, sure, is, is very useful um, because it gives uh, a map to navigate into the Xylella uh, pathosystem. You find the bacterium, then you find the insect vector, and then you may find some resistant uh, cultivar or tolerant cultivar. But in the meantime, um, we should be aware of what happens outside the triad, uh, in the social, in the cultural, and the political world. Because at, at, at the end, uh, there is where um, the triad acts uh, and where the expert of the triad work, and where the plant pathologist happens. Last, last slide. So yeah, uh, this is, can be translated in specific uh, research practices. Uh, uh, a promising way to think about this problem is a multidisciplinary convergence. Uh, for example, two years ago, um, Monique Moritz presented, a, uh, and Franco Ferilli presented a, a very interesting uh, project, within Ponte project, um, um, but also, for example, for what concerns Brigitte in the UK, uh, there is Mariella Marzano, which is a social anthropologist, uh, very interesting work. Um, and, and even within the field of plant science, there is a need for new framing models um, that, that serves not only as a contour, but a crucial part embedded in the process of uh, uh, knowledge making. Uh, to conclude, I leave to, 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 to the last slide presented by yeah, so uh, after the, the very last comment we would like to, uh, to, to make is a feedback towards the research community in itself. And what we discover is, so to say, two regime of knowledge production that you well know in this room. The first one is this one that's connect directly bounds of knowledge to decision making. What we saw specifically, specifically in the infected area is a complex situation of various type of research work, laboratory life, labor laboratory uh, research, also field research, and this specific type of research that has been presented uh, this morning also, it's this research connecting with critical zone. <coughs> the second point which is extremely important for us is how the scientific production has to face a kind of possible division between what is defined as a problem by various stakeholders and actors and what is defined as a manager, a management situation, something that, for example, social uh, uh, authorities uh, can target uh, as a, a, a system of measure. So when problem definition and problem solving are disentangled, this is where I think the most, uh, difficult, uh, dif the most uh, difficulties occur for research communities. And that has also to do with the notion of decentralized centers of powers, meaning that we can see in Mallorca, in Corsica, but also in Puglia, how much the local decision making is deeply connected with the, the type of social life uh, that occurs in this type of zone that becomes critical. And we all share the idea that what is now happening within these zones is very much important, both for scientific production and also for the experience of living with Zilela. Thank you very much. Thank you. You already used all the time for questions, but since we will have now uh, a common session, so I invite all the rest of our speakers to come to the scenario. And I would like just to, to remind you that this is, this is a scientific conference, so we will focus on research, we will focus maybe in social impacts, but we are not going to focus on legal policies or legislation, okay? So 
we have some time for questions and discussions. center yeah. thank you uh, my question is for uh, people involved in modeling spread of uh, cellular diseases um, I missed something uh, I'm not sure if it was presented during the meeting but related with the role of nurseries and the trading pathways uh, how how you can incorporate that into the models or if you are working on that and a second aspect is the eventual discovery if it is probably not but uh, of a treatment to uh, uh, decrease the severity of the disease on infected trees for example uh, because in this second case uh, we can have a more optimistic future because until now everything is pessimistic. So uh, I, I want to see something about that. This is for the whole people in the uh, presenters in the table. Um, I, ca I can answer one part just about the trade. We included the uh, one indicator in our analysis and uh, we use uh, the quarantine status of the different uh, third countries that are trading with the European Union. So we try to estimate a potential cost for the European, European Union in case some of these uh, countries uh, ban the trade with the European Union. So until that, it's our contribution. And for the other questions, I, I don't know. <laughs> None of the speakers want to give some idea or opinion on that? No? <laughs> okay. It works, yes. <laughs> um, so in terms of the, sp the spread modeling, um, in the PRA, I, I, a lot of it is a, um, spread by natural means. Um, but then I think Dan, if he's here, they, they, we also included a long range jump section in the model. And I guess some of that could be um, driven by trade movements or human movements of infected planting material. Um, but I think it's interesting in, in that trying to characterize trade networks in terms of the, the, the spread of infected material through them um, is, is important in terms of establishing new, new foci. Um, but, but it's incredibly challenging in terms of characterizing uh, where, how these movements happen. And you know, in, in animal diseases and light livestock diseases, they, they have quite good data on, on, on this sort of thing, but it's, it's more challenging, I think, in, in plant health. More questions? Tony? So thank you for this nice session. Uh, this is a question for all the modelers in, in the session. Uh, as Berta pointed out, uh, data are needed to answer questions and data are needed to develop the models. But also Stephen Parnell uh, pointed out sometimes data is not available or maybe data is available but not uh, collected in the way that is useful for the models because it's maybe not random sampling, things like that. So more and more, and Olaf, I think, is expert on that topic, expert knowledge solicitation is being used in the context of risk assessment. So my question is, how do you see the future of, of risk assessment more and more based on, on expert knowledge solicitation, the benefits or drawbacks of, of this methodology? Yes, um, thanks for the question. Uh, of course, we are using expert knowledge elicitation more and more. 
because EFSA is obliged to give an opinion in a recent time frame. And when the research is lacking, then we have still to answer. And this is a possibility to answer, to describe the uncertainty and the limitation of the evidence we have. And this is why you get these kind of complicated curves or intervals as answers instead of a clear answer. Um, but of course, uh, the idea behind is that the researcher here in the audience get also the information where, where more data are needed. And in fact, I would like to invite you to take the PEST reports, and of course, especially the PEST report from Xylella, to read where in our elicitations the expert pointed out limitations in the knowledge. And you find it in the section where we describe the uncertainty and where we describe the different scenarios where, in principle, it's difficult to decide which kind of scenario is the truth. And uh, to get more knowledge there would be very helpful. So I think expert elicitation is one feature for EFSA to give a quick answer, because this is our job, to give advice to the risk manager, uh, to describe the uncertainty. But it's also an instrument for researchers to find questions where really data are needed and new uh, experiments should be done. And uh, so for every feedback from your side, if this is helpful for your new research strategy, it would be also nice for me. Thank you. Did you want to contribute any of yeah, the I would like modelers? To add a, a, a comment on this, because before this program, I've been working in co terror and plant food set, uh, plant food and net foods uh, network of excellence. And that was about more uh, agroterrorism things. And we had to do the same type of work uh, meaning to explore the capacity of experts to describe uh, not only thresholds and but also the confidence they have in terms of the the here the perpetrators even knowledge about this type of uh, of pest. So why I want to put what I want to emphasize is here is the need for experts to not only have knowledge belonging to the realm of laboratory production of modelization, but also to work directly with the field to have the feeling and the notion of, of what it means, a threat, at the level of practices. And many of them uh, are more confident when they have this contact with the, with the field in terms of deliver uh, uh, qualitative appreciation that then after you can uh, reprocess in terms of bias and methods and other types. So this link is very important to ensure that at the European level we have also some 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 sort of thick knowledge based also on the relation to the field. Maybe sh shortly without making a ping pong. Um, many, many uh, lacks in knowledge we have really when it comes to the practice. So when we want to really estimate what happens when the laboratory research went into practice, and yes, please go to the field work and, and get the experience there. More questions? I have a question for Peter Beck. Uh, so uh, we see more and more that uh, newer bricks have been found in Europe on almond of quite some extension in Alicante. Uh, we have a containment area in Balearic, in Corsica. Uh, now we will have a presentation uh, in another session about a new outbreak of uh, Xylella in Almond in Israel. So some of the situation are old in the sense that were unknown uh, to the farmer the cause of the disease, so uh, they went unnoticed for some time. So how, what is the possibility of using the satellite uh, image analysis to looking for tree decline symbol, uh, area of tree decline to identify uh, uh, outbreak of uh, potential outbreak in large areas. So, I mean, if you want to explore all Southern Europe, Mediterranean, Northern countries, and see where you have problem, potential problem of uh, tree decline, which could be associated with Xylella. So, I think the the method we used here is is what you say. It's picking up decline, um, and it's not. It should have potential beyond olive groves, beyond uh, Puglia, uh, 
and really picking up areas where uh, vegeta landscape dominated by vegetation is not behaving like it was in the past, which often is decline. Um, I want to put the brakes on in raising expectations on d or doing early detection. Right? We're not doing early detection. But for larger regional monitoring of areas where, we, where damage might be widespread, I think this is something we want to test with this method. Uh, personally, I've been thinking more towards non-quarantine pests. You know, we've had huge bark beetle outbreaks this summer uh, in Central Europe. Eastern Europe has had it for years. Uh, this method might have potential to help us map and track those. Um, the, the challenge of early detection is really a different one. Uh, and the tools are really different. It all falls on the remote sensing, but it's, it's very, very wide, of course. Uh, and if we want to help improve early detection, it's another set of tools. We might have a few cases where damage has gone unnoticed for a while, or or we might now want to retrospectively look when did this start. We see now that it's widespread and we want to trace back when could it have originated. Perhaps there we can, with, with these satellite-based methods, also provide some insights. There's a talk in the, in the next session also on, uh, on honing down on, on more detail with satellite data. More questions? Okay, with that. Hello, uh, I'm Sibron Foss from European Food Safety Authority. I had a question, I think it's for everybody, because in fact, all the work that was presented <coughs> is uh, all about crops. It's all about uh, cult uh, managed areas. N there's nothing that came out of how, how do we deal with these infections, the, the, the down lower part of the iceberg, the infections that are in natural environments, and so on. Could we use some of these methods to assess, like uh, remote sensing, to assess a change in a landscape in a non-managed area? To what extent, wh is that, uh, is, are there so many lim technical limitations to go further in that? Are we interested in it? And for the prioritization of pests, we don't deal with the impacts of, of a pest on a natural environment, which we cannot maybe uh, assess uh, its economic value. No? Thank you for your nice question. Uh, actually, uh, for the priority pest analysis, uh, we started with, uh, I think, about 30 pests uh, of analysis. And uh, I don't remember now the figures, but uh, maybe 10 out of the 30 were forestry pests. So I invite you to check the report and then you can see some figures on the production loss for the forestry production. And uh, also we have some indicators for the environmental part that uh, for the crop production and for the forestry production that uh, can be of uh, interest. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a crucial question and many people working either on the biology of the insects and vectors, but also on potentially the reservoir uh, that can be existing in the wild, or in not necessarily very far, it can be here at the roundabout. You can have an, ol have an olive tree infected. So the, the issue is also to have a, a detailed approach, an ecological approach of all these places that could be in the wild to very domestic uh, approach, to very domestic, um, sorry, planting of uh, various type of plants, not on the olive tree, polygala, for example. So it means that the, the connection between the precise cartographic approach of this diversity of plant, that, of hosted plant, and also the, the view from the space, I think is much needed to, uh, to, to precise answer the question uh, you're raising. The second point that could be made also is, as our colleague showed it, all agricultural fields don't necessarily look like one another. You had to make something like a, a typology of the intensity of yield, for example. So there also, the notion of cultivated era has to be particularly targeted in terms of how much it could be agroecological, not only for, I would say, 
political or ideological reason, but here basically for also biological understanding of the type of biodiversity and also biological regulation that could be um, existing in this type of biotop uh, according to the, the biology of the emergence or outbreaks or even the endemicization of, uh, of threats. So I think there's here again a connection between the type of knowledge, ecological knowledge, uh, agronomic knowledge and also other more uh, biogenomics uh, knowledge about host plants and, and etc. I think it's, it's refer also to our capacity of organizing uh, uh, the field of, of knowledge to really answer the, the European threat, as you said before. Yeah, I have a, a last comment, and maybe Kevin can be the person to, to answer. So I think this is the first time I see real numbers uh, based on scientific data, because uh, since many, many years we have read on the news uh, that 10 million olive trees were affected or were already dead in the, in the area. So now you have a more realistic uh, uh, image of uh, what is the real situation in the area of, uh, of, of that is not uh, going under eradication anymore and is not monitored. And you have real data that the uh, use of resistant olive cultivars uh, can be a solution to decrease the cost of, or, or at least to, to, to increase the benefit of, of the farmer. So maybe it can be a possibility to, to look into the uh, a long time frame in 25 years, can, which can be the real cause of uh, reconstructing the olive uh, landscape in, in Puglia. Um, uh, how can we um, help to, to, to promote that this happen and Puglia can start being what uh, it was a few years ago? Yeah. I think the comment you made is quite good. Uh, in fact, the study we did right now that I presented today is a simulation into the future. We project spread that has not had happened yet. Um, I think a very natural second study could be what was the damage that actually was realized in Apulia and what would be the cost to change the system there. But it would be a completely different analysis. We would need different economic data preferably from the statistical office in Apulia to parameterize the model to the economic conditions in that area. But uh, the framework could be used for this assessment as well. Okay, so I want to thank all the speakers for keeping on time. Uh, thank you for...